You can't talk about proteins without thinking about protein structure. And we've already begun that. You now know that the reason that proteins don't just act like a string of beads is because those beads interact with each other to form twists and turns that create a shape of this particular polymer. Now, that structure is understood on four different levels. The first level is primary structure. Primary means first. So this is the first level of structure that we think about. And this level, primary structure, is literally the sequence of the amino acids. All those amino acids had names, right? Let's go back here. So first, I'm going to put a threonine, and then make sure you put a histidine, and Oh, by the way, a lysine goes after that, and then a glutamine, and then a cysteine, right? So that would be the primary structure. Now, let's jump from primary structure over to tertiary structure. Tertiary structure is the overall three-dimensional shape of that particular protein. And it's kind of like saying, I'm going to start out with metal and plastic and glass, and that'll be my primary structure. And what will I end up with? I'll end up with a motorcycle, or I'll end up with a computer, or I'll end up with a cell phone, right? So the tertiary structure is when you're done, what do you have? What is the shape of it? Now, let's go backwards from there and talk about secondary structure. Secondary structure is something called domains. And protein biochemists, like I used to be, Think about proteins in, in terms of domains. The two most famous domains as part of protein structure is the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet. In my mind, the alpha helix, it is a curl. And I think of it as kind of like a wheel, right? Something that turns. Whereas the beta pleated sheet is like a platform something that is broad and stable and you could put things on. So if I had lots of different domains, I could put them together to create a tertiary structure, a robot, if you will, do, to do whatever I wanted it to do. Um, so for example, oh, and see, protein biochemists think of it this way. If we're looking at the amino acid sequence of a protein, its primary structure, and we notice that there is a domain that looks like this, let's imagine a domain that looks like a wheel. If I was just, you know, discovering some machine and I saw four wheels on it, I would assume that either it's a mode of transportation or whatever this machine is, it needs to roll. Now, does it necessarily? No, not necessarily, but it gives me a clue, right? So primary structure, amino acid sequence. Tertiary structure, when you're done, what have you got? Secondary structure are the individual little pieces like a wheel or a turbine or a platform that I could put together to create the tertiary structure, the robot that I want. Now, what is quaternary structure? First of all, not all, quaternary, not all proteins have quaternary structure. Whenever um, I tell you that this is a protein that you can see through the microscope, or a protein like hair, or a protein like fingernail that you can see with the naked eye, well, that is a protein that does have quaternary structure. Because individual uh, protein subunits, way too small to be seen with even the most powerful light microscopes. So when there is a protein, like we will be looking at myosin through the microscope. Uh, I will show you collagen probably through the microscope or hair. Whenever we can see something and it's big, it's because individual subunits like this, way too small to be seen, get put together to create very large and often very strong structures like hair or like your Achilles tendon. Ready? Make sure you know those different levels of protein structure. Primary, that is just the sequence. There's a histidine and then there is a cysteine, you know, 
something like that. Secondary structure is like, okay, these guys go together and they make little subunits that we can use as like little modules to create ultimately the tertiary structure that we want. And sometimes proteins get put together into larger structures. Now, hemoglobin actually has got four subunits, but quaternary structure doesn't mean four subunits. Quaternary structure is like the fourth level of understanding protein structure. It just happens that hemoglobin has got four subunits. So as we've just been saying, proteins create their own shape. As a matter of fact, as those beads get put on the string and they come out of the ribosome, those, those individual side groups will just interact with each other to create the um, robot as it goes. Imagine if you got a box from Ikea and as you open the box, the pieces started coming out and as they came out, they interacted with each other so that by the time they all came out of the box, you got yourself a table or a bookcase or whatever. I should suggest that to the IKEA folks. Uh, if they could do that, then they would do what proteins do when they are made by ribosomes. What are ribosomes doing? They're attaching the amino acids together by peptide bonds, by the process of dehydration synthesis. And as they are assembled, these proteins create their own shape. And this is important. The shape of a protein is essential to the function of a protein. Let's imagine that my protein is a robot, and this robot is going to grab two things and put them together, and then grab two things and put them together, right? If this part of my robot's not put together right, because I got the wrong amino acid there, then it would grab things, but it couldn't slam them together. It would grab things, but it couldn't slam them together. If any part of the protein's shape isn't right, then the protein can't do what the protein's supposed to do, right? And the shape is dictated by the interactions of the adjacent side groups by things, side groups, like ionic bonds, by interactions like, like ionic bonds or hydrophobic, hydrophilic interactions. Enzymes, you've got a whole lab on enzymes, and enzymes are just one example of proteins working as a machine, but they're great examples of it. So here's the way they depict this protein. I wish they would depict them more like robots, but that's me. And you see this area right here and this area right here? These areas are areas known as active sites, and the active sites of an enzyme are like the little grabby hands of my imaginary robot. The active sites will form a temporary bond with what are called substrates or reactants. And for a moment, probably just a millisecond, this will be a single molecule. And then the enzyme will either rip things apart or put them together. And as soon as that happens, the enzyme lets go, and then these active sites are ready to pick up two new substrates. All right. So what do proteins do? Everything. As I said in lecture one, almost everything that an organ does is done because its cells do it. And the reason its cells can do whatever this thing is is because of what proteins are doing, right? So ultimately, if I tell you that your muscle contracts, is the muscle contracting? Yeah, but only because proteins inside the muscle are doing something. So examples of proteins, structural proteins. The collagen fibers are what make your Achilles tendon strong, all right? Uh, there's keratin in your skin that makes your skin uh, waterproof. Those are proteins. Enzymes, we'll talk more about them, but they're little robots that put things together, take things apart. Antibodies are proteins. They're a very important part of our immune system. Right now, we are trying to develop a vaccine against COVID-19, against SARS-CoV-2, right? Um, and 
our, one of our intentions is to, to use an injection so that the, your immune system will make a protein called an antibody that will attach to that bad virus and keep it from being able to make you sick. Receptors. We, I use the word receptors in two different ways, and I really shouldn't. I should call receptors the proteins that are on the surface of cells, and I should call receptor cells receptor cells. But receptors are proteins that are generally integral to the cell membrane of a cell and allows that cell to receive communication from somewhere else. We're going to be talking about the endocrine system pretty quickly. And the reason that there are cells in your body that know when there is insulin around is because of proteins called receptors on the surface of cells. And then carriers. Carriers are proteins that will bring things into the cell that cannot diffuse across the cell membrane. So proteins are doing almost everything. Okay, enzymes. All righty, I don't know why we're back here. Proteins, even though they start out being like beads on a string, they are not strings of beads. They are things with structure and shape. Um, this particular um, uh, protein that you see here, uh, his name is dynein, and he actually is a little like FedEx delivery guy. He carries a big balloon filled with molecules on his head, and he walks along a really big protein, a protein with huge quaternary structure called a microtubule, and he actually walks one step at a time, one step at a time, and would take a cargo from, for example, the rough endoplasmic reticulum over to the Golgi apparatus. Remember those from AP150? Rough endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus. Here is one that is a carrier protein. A molecule like glucose would bind right in this area here, and as soon as that glucose bound, chunk, then this whole molecule would change shape, chunk, 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 and in changing shape, it will allow the glucose to go into the cell when normally glucose cannot get across the phospholipid bilayer. So proteins are amazing machines. So far, we've talked about carbohydrates and fats and proteins. Now we need to talk about amino acids. And so I will start that at the beginning of the next lecture.